This is one heck of a conversion story. I am joined this week by my longtime friend and Catholic convert, Joe Goodwin, to tell his story. Uh, the story of a Bible college student of a guy steeped in the evangelical Pentecostal tradition who encounters the church fathers, begins to encounter Catholic questions, and eventually becomes a Catholic convert. But that's not where it ends, because Joe's conversion story uh, impacted me uh, in real time and years later and intertwines again together for better or for worse at the uh, uh, years later in, in our journeys in parish ministry too. This is an amazing story of really something I always uh, or often talk about on this show, which is uh, one particular Protestant evangelical minister who impacted me in the questions that he asked asking about the early church and looking for answers. And I was an intern at his church, and, and the sounding board for some of those questions that he asked, well, it turns out the roots of those questions came when conversations that him and Joe were having. So here was I, the third wheel in these conversations, and well, here comes comes around now full circle. This is one heck of a conversion story that Joe has to tell, and so fascinating to me how my own journey intersects in that conversation too, and that journey. It's awesome. An amazing conversation. I hope you like it. Please watch. Please enjoy. Please like the video. Subscribe to help grow this channel, and thank you so much. God bless. Hi, hey, welcome back to the show. Thanks for watching. Thank you for listening. If you're listening on Apple Podcasts or on Spotify, please leave a rating and a review that helps to push the podcast out to more listeners and helps episodes like these, these conversations reach more listeners. And I think they'll they'll want to hear this kind of awesome stuff. If you are watching on YouTube, thank you. Make sure you subscribe to this channel, help to grow this channel bit by bit and uh, interact below in the comments, guys. Let us know what you think and uh, and engage with us in these conversations. Uh, that that's great, guys, and thanks for watching. Uh, this week, I am joined, uh, uh, I'll put it this way, <laughs> I'm joined by, I'll introduce, him, I'll introduce him first, okay, Joe, this is backwards, I'll do it this way, Joe. I am joined by Joe Goodwin. He is Executive Director of the Canadian Priest for the Third Millennium, supporting the formation and needs of priests, seminarians, and discerners who lead the renewal of the Church in Canada. After time as a Protestant minister, Joe was received into full communion in the Catholic Church in 2010, and since then has served in leadership roles in lay Catholic ministries, including six years as campus minister for the Diocese of Hamilton's University Chaplaincy in Waterloo. He has a passion to be part of the spread and revival of the Catholic faith in Canada by sharing the gospel with those around him, indeed igniting evangelistic, evangelistic fervor in young Catholics. This is a great, great intro, Joe. <laughs> and the promotion of the Catholic, uh, Canadian Catholic priesthood. Joe lives outside Waterloo, Ontario with his eight favorite people and an assortment of critters. I can attest to all this. Uh, Joe, thanks for being here. Welcome to the show and hello. Hello, it is so great to be cordial with you this evening. Okay, uh, I'll tell you this now. I wasn't <laughs> sure to say this before after I introduced you, Joe. I, I, in the four and a half years of doing this show, I've been excited. I've had all kinds of fantastic guests, okay? I, I've met a lot of my heroes, too. I'm, I'm thinking of the Scott Hans, the Rod Bennons, the Paul McCuskers, these guys that I looked, I looked up to and got to interview on this show, Joe. But I don't know that I have been more excited than I have been to do an interview, honestly, than I am this week to talk to you, Joe. Uh, uh, so, small wow. compliment. Small compliment <laughs> to you. Okay, small hat tip to you, because I mean this is such a fun story to tell. Because our two conversion stories, yours and mine, have these weird overlaps and and weave kind of together in strange and distant kind of ways. And I think I'm so excited to bring to listeners uh, and to viewers. Uh, into this story because I just think it's so interesting and I'm excited to, after all these years, to sit down with you together and, and to share this story because, I don't know, I, I think, maybe it's just because <laughs> I'm in this one show, but it, it, <laughs> that's what it's, it is. <laughs> that's, <laughs> all, that's all that it is. <laughs> I think it's so fascinating how the Lord really brought us together. I, from my perspective, on kind of two sides of a discussion, both on kind of parallel tracks into the Catholic faith, 
Gosh, there's so much in here in the story, Joe. So I, I don't think I have been more excited for an interview than I am than I am this week. Um, so thank you for making this work. Wow. I and don't I'm, even know what to say to that. I'm so, I mean, I've I'm, been super excited about it, too. I just didn't think that, that was what it was for you. My goodness. I'm really just so thrilled to be here and uh, yeah, to be part of the school, uh, school enterprise. I'm trying to think of an analogy of like, you know, that like when somebody finally meets, like, you know, is so excited for this, this one day and one guy comes, oh, yeah, this? Yeah, I'm just, I'm here to do this. You're, you're excited for this? Oh, okay, I'm just, I'm just, here I am just gushing. And, and, oh, I'm and, excited. And Joe rolls excited. up, yeah, okay, let's just do this. <clears throat> <laughs> now listen, I'm going to call you Joey, I'm sure a bunch of times, because I know you, I, I've known you when I first met you as Joey, so we're calling you Joe, this is what I've been told by your PR well, people. That's that's um, my PR people, that's okay, <laughs> because I mean, everybody who's known me since I was a calf, you know, calls me uh, Joey, and that's totally all right. <laughs> okay, good. But I, I go by Joe yeah. most of the time, or Joseph. So if I slip, I'll, so if I slip... We know where that came from. Otherwise, I'll call you. You're among the privileged few who can because you knew me long enough ago that that's kind of how I went. Yeah, (laughs) that's wonderful. I love that. Okay, so let's. I I don't want to even begin with the story. I mean, you probably do. I I want to you to begin to unspin your story, uh, Joe. And I don't know if I wait till the end to jump in, like, hey, here's where I come in the story, and 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 I jump in all foamy at the mouth. But uh, (laughs) we'll see where we'll see where it goes. Uh, go back as far as you want to go back. Tell us kind of your, your origin story, and we'll, we'll, then we'll walk towards your journey into the Catholic faith, and we'll see we'll see at what point I, I, I come along. I mean, you were already Catholic for a while before I came Catholic, so it was, became Catholic. So I think it's probably I, I'm probably maybe late to the party a little bit, but I, I, I'm curious also because. I haven't heard in depth your side of the story, so I'm kind of I'm kind of curious. I've heard bits and pieces. I've known you for a long time now, but I don't think we sat down and you said, "Okay, here's where I began. Here's the step of the way." We have right. lots we have lots in common, but I don't I don't quite know where how it fits together. So I'm going to sit back. We're going to sit back, un, unfurl your your fantastic uh, conversion story, Joe, where the okay. Lord led don't you. It. <laughs> it's a guy. <laughs> It's a guy who came to the Catholic faith through some interesting uh, yeah, means okay. from an interesting place. But you'll, you'll keep me from, you know, getting caught in some kind of backwater along this yeah, stream, right? Because yeah, uh, okay. I yeah, tend to do yeah, that. I go yeah. down a rabbit hole. I'll help paddle, paddle you out of the weeds if you get there. Perfect. Joe. Perfect. <laughs> okay. Where does it right. begin for you? Uh, on a cold Tuesday morning. Uh, no. <laughs> Montreal General <laughs> Hospital. <laughs> I don't even know if it was a Tuesday or cold. But it was September. And uh, I was born in Montreal. Uh, to uh, two parents who uh, both were in Pentecostal ministry. Um, and uh, funny funny fact, because it's already, you know, we've given away the, the punchline that I, I became Catholic. Um, I was born, this, this is significant, on, on September the 29th, 1978. Now, <laughs> excuse me, exactly 100 years prior to that, uh, Bishop Michael Power consecrated... Um, uh, St. Michael's Cathedral in Toronto. And uh, I was born and, and first lived on a street called Bishop Power. Um, <laughs> not only that, but, uh, you know, so 100 years to the, uh, from, you know, uh, to the day from when that happened, I'm born there. There we are. I'm born on uh, the feast of St. Michael. And I was born about uh, just a few days before, uh, it was actually the day after John Paul I died. And so it was just a few, you know, it was a week or so before John Paul II, well, before Cardinal Wojtyla became John Paul II. And if you had told my parents that later on I would be working at a place called the St. John Paul II Student Center, connected yes. to a place called St. Michael's Church, <laughs> wow. and that I would have become Catholic on the Feast of St. Michael, wow. uh, I think they would have uh, cast all the demons out of you, and they would have bound whatever there could be bound and loosed whatever could be loosed. And uh, yeah, they would have they would have rebuked you <laughs> harshly. Um, but you know, I had a really really fantastic uh, childhood for the most part, and uh, you know, my I have wonderful parents, and uh, they raised me to love Jesus. And I remember at age four, kneeling beside my bed, and you know, in the words of a four year old, right? I I remember kind of just closing my eyes and saying, "God, I want to be your child." Yeah. And I'm sorry <laughs> for my sins. You know, please forgive me. I want to be your child, and that's all I knew, right? Um, and uh, that's all I had to know, 
when I was four. And my mom, I remember she uh, she gave me uh, one of those uh, picture Bibles, kind of like a comic book style Bible, but like it's old kind. I can still tell you what like Laban or yeah. Hezekiah <laughs> or Moses wore because they wore the yeah. same thing throughout yeah. the entire. So uh, she gave it to me. I devoured the Old Testament in one uh, day. And she quizzed me on it the next day. And then she came, and then she said, okay, now read the New Testament, which I did in less than a day. And uh, she quizzed me on that. Uh, this is picture form, right? So, And uh, I remember just falling in love with the Bible. Yeah. It's like she was very good. And and I, I went, you know, the experience of Sunday school and going to a church, an evangelical Protestant church, it was Pentecostal. Um, just growing up with Bible, Bible, Bible being just presented and it was never shoved down my throat it was always very beautiful it was always presented as the you know these are the words of eternal life and like yes you know and they did bring such you know uh i still do obviously uh, bring incredible life and consolation to me um my relationship to god uh you know even in prayer takes a scriptural form you know not just through the mass and through all of the sacraments which are heavily heavily scriptural but um my prayer to God is often just is the Psalms is, is, uh, uh, you know, it's anyway. It's, so scripture has been very, very important to me. And of course I was raised to believe that scripture was the only rule for faith and practice. Um, and that the, uh, no other source of authority was ever relevant to the Christian life <clears throat> other than, you know, we always made exceptions, right? Your parents, all of your parents are godly authority. You don't just, when you obey them, you obey God. Okay. Wait a second. Right. It's kind of like the whole, uh, we don't like statues except at Christmas. Yeah. <laughs> And, you know, we don't believe in any human authority, no human authorities from God, but the government, you got to obey them. And your parents, well, yeah, that's godly authority, but nobody else. Okay, your pastor, well, yeah, to a limited degree, that's God's authority too. But you know what I mean? Like they, they, yeah. <clears throat> so many, so many Protestant um, traits, evangelical Protestant traits kind of start the first few paths down the road to Rome yeah. uh, and they just never finish the journey. And, uh, and I don't, by by saying that and by sometimes poking fun, I don't for any moment uh, intend to belittle anyone or mock anyone. There are some, there are, there are Protestant, uh, you know, scholars who I could never go up against uh, in terms of, uh, uh, you know, theological uh, d debates and discussions. Um, but it's just the way it is or the way I see it. You know, so many people have used it phrases like uh, the land of more or when, or the church is so much bigger on the inside than on the outside, that kind of thing. Anyway, I don't, intend to denigrate anyone but that was my experience um loving scripture it kind of stopped there you know in terms of authority uh i definitely enjoyed um the experience of church the experience of sunday school youth group um all the things that we did missions uh, i you know i went door to door evangelizing like these were all things that were part of my life and and i loved it and i, I still do i can there are those parts of just living the christian life yeah. i never had to renounce when i became catholic anyway Fast forward a number of years, uh, I get married, you know, I get into ministry, I, uh, we have children, and I guess it was about, I was about 25 when I, yeah, I was taking a graduate course uh, in uh, patristic theology, and I remember, um, I remember reading St. Augustine, I would never have called him St. Augustine, it was just Augustine of Hippo, <clears throat> and, uh, you know, father of Western theology, kind of was a theological hero of mine. And I remember thinking, you know, kind of dawning on me one day that he's Catholic. And, you know, not only because Catholic was the only game in town, it was, uh, you know, he was most definitely Catholic by choice because he didn't, he wasn't always that way. And uh, he said some of the most Catholic things that have ever been said. So uh, therefore, you know, given that he is truly Catholic, like Roman Catholic, I realized, oh, he's wrong about everything. <laughs> Because literally, you know, in Sunday school, yeah. when they would read something, especially from like Romans or Galatians or something, they would read a verse and they'd be, okay, now this could mean this, but we know it doesn't mean that. And why? Not because the rest of scripture says otherwise, not because it's clearly on the face of it, not that way, but because the Roman Catholic Church teaches it. Yeah, yeah. The, the Catholics say that, therefore, that's not the way to understand this verse. Anyway, it's because I was sort of caught up in that, even, you know, even as an adult, um, the, obviously Augustine was wrong about everything. So I kind of had to step away from studies for a bit. And I actually uh, went on, uh, some people would call it a red letter quest. You know, when you go through the, the scriptures and just take out the words of Christ and try to distill the essential uh, revelation of God to humankind. I did a similar thing with the uh, apostolic fathers. And I figured, you know, especially since evangelical Protestantism at the time and even now, is was kind of going through a, an existential crisis, not really able to determine what constitutes being a Christian. 
either doctrinally, morally, um, um, liturgically, sacramentally. They just couldn't define it. <clears throat> um, and by the way, I wasn't running from that. I was actually part. I was participating in that process with my, uh, you know, fellow Christians uh, of, of discerning and discovering. But I thought, you know, at some point. The Apostolic Fathers, the the guys who learned the faith from Peter, James, and John, and those guys, right? I'm talking about uh, Irenaeus and Ignatius and Clement and and uh, you know uh, Polycarp and this this whole group, either one or two generations removed from the the apostles themselves. And I thought, okay, whatever they all have in common, it's got to be the essential gospel, the part you know. This is the the core that you can't get rid of. And I thought, I honestly thought, in my ignorance, that I would come across. Um, you know, justification by faith, uh, some version of sola scriptura, even though the Bible, the New Testament didn't exist, um, uh, because there are references in the New Testament to to the writings, right? Uh, so not going beyond what was written, etc. Um, and so I thought I'd see that. I thought I'd see a bunch of, well, Protestant tropes. And I didn't find that. What I found was a commitment to a common uh, liturgy, a commitment to a common authority, being the bishop who himself was in, subject to uh, uh, communion with the Bishop of Rome. And I found uh, devotion to the saints, especially the martyrs and the mother of God. Um, and most importantly, uh, a belief in the real presence of Jesus in the Eucharist. Yeah. And that blew my mind. I mean, I kind of knew that some of these things were present in the early church fathers, but I didn't realize that if you just distill it down to the apostolic fathers, this is the main feature. These are the main features. And I kind of went, this is problematic for me uh, because it seems to indicate the Catholic church might be more than just, you know, one of the Christian movements out there. Again, being rooted in history, I kind of knew that the Catholic church, you know, has that pedigree that no other group has. And yet uh, I was kind of, baffled by how real that became when I read the, uh, you know, the second generation of, of fathers. And I kind of, again, had to step back as, you know, when something hits you that emotionally and that, yeah, that yeah. inescapably, you kind of, I just kind of reel a bit, you know, <laughs> kind of dissociate a bit in a way. <laughs> yeah. Um, because I was trying to remain, you know, tr try to ne negotiate this path more intellectually. And what kept happening is I get, you know, attacked from the side by these these feelings of a longing for something I've I, I've never had, I'm almost a nostalgia for something I've never had, um, and also just severe resistance. Like I'm, you know, if I go through this intellectually, I, I, I'm participating with the wisdom of man, and um, you know, I gotta be I gotta be preserved from that. It's the wisdom of God, you know. Just raise your hands and dim the lights and put on a soft keyboard pad, and you'll get in touch with God. You know, that's your portal to heaven. So anyway, discovering all this and I stepped away and I had to come back to it. And I did sort of a, a Lee Strobel type thing. And uh, I don't know if you're familiar with the case for Christ. He, you know, he's a journalist and he had to write all the objections he had to the Christian faith, specifically the resurrection of Christ. And so he wrote, this is why it can't happen. This is why it can't happen. This is why. And so I wrote down all of the typical Protestant objections to the Catholic faith, right? You know them all. Purgatory, the communion of saints, Marian spirituality, uh, the papacy, uh, sacraments, the priesthood, all this kind of stuff. Um, and I did exactly what Strobel did, which is go through each one, try to root myself historically, philosophically, theologically, logically down uh, every one of these paths, uh, trying to understand, you know, trying to disprove the Catholic faith. And, and I kind of knew going in that it was futile. The reason is... If the second generation of apostles got it wrong, then all of Christianity is a sham. Like we're just the Kiwanis Club with a cross, right? And funny hats. Uh, yeah. And uh, it's not worth it um, if they got it wrong in the second generation when Jesus said that the gates of hell will not prevail. So um, I kind of knew that something's got to give. Uh, and then I went through every single argument and I proved myself wrong unintentionally. I had to go through the entire papal magisterium and conciliar magisterium. That took a little while, like a matter of years. Uh, by that, I mean every document that um, every pope and every council has ever put out. It's like, it's an encyclopedia set yeah, um, yeah. worth. And I had, to, because here's why I had to find a contradiction. Yeah. Yeah. Right. I had to, and I was not going to rely on secondary literature. There's so much Catholic apologetic literature out there. And a lot of it's very, very, very good. And some of it's okay. Yeah. 
and I did not want to run across. Uh, yeah, I didn't want to base my arguments. If I was going to change my life, which it looked like I was going to, left ministry and everything because I realized I was not going to be an evangelical Protestant my whole life, or at least not an evangelical. And uh, I kind of said, <laughs> you know, I kind of I, I kind of went down that path saying, if this is right, if this is true, I have to follow it. Um, I was first convinced by the efficacy of Christian baptism and apostolic succession. And once you do that, you're kind of toast, right? <laughs> working my way toward the Eucharist and then, you know, all sorts of other do uh, doctrines kind of, yeah, okay. That's sort of answered, not answered. And then I hit the Eucharist, which I think I was avoiding. I think there was something inside me that avoided that discovery. Um, and I'll never forget. I'll never forget going to mass uh, really for the first time I'd been to some weddings but not consciously recognize that this is a mass. Yeah, yeah. And I remember going to a mass for the first time, going to mass and the consecration and everyone, you know, how many people tell this story, right? But the words I use are, is at the consecration. I was like, I know you, that's, <laughs> that's you. I wow. know you, right? Yeah. Because I've, I've been in love with Jesus since I was four and, you know, being in front of the Eucharist for the first time and recognizing the Eucharist, you know, as, as St. Paul says, recognize the body. Um, you, you kind of, I kind of realized how much I didn't know him. You know, it's almost like you know, going through a, <laughs> going through a, a sort of a, a tiff with your spouse. You know, you, you, of course I know you, I, I know you very well. And then on the other side of the fight, it's like, oh, I didn't know you very well. You know, I just discovered something about you. And it's the same thing with Jesus, except yeah, we didn't have yeah. a fight. I just became conscious of how much more present he is to his church than I ever thought. I always thought it was us going to the throne room of God through the blood of Christ. That's not an inaccurate image, but way more important than that, way more important than that, is Jesus coming to us through his own blood yeah. and body and soul oh, and divinity. Right, so I kind of recognized uh, bits and pieces of that. I don't know if I would have been able to describe it that way, but it was just this visceral. It went from being an intellectual journey to a spiritual and emotional and heartfelt one because it was like, yeah, that's you. And I remember going to adoration for the first time. Uh, I think you probably know the the friend that uh, invited me as well um, to adoration. Uh, she was my sort of predecessor and then colleague in campus ministry. Um, you you probably know her, but anyway, yeah. uh, mm -hmm. she invited me to uh, to. Um, adoration. And uh, I, again, I had the same experience. And I didn't know when you go to adoration, you're supposed to genuflect. But I went in, in, in the room and I fell to both knees kind of almost involuntarily because <laughs> I was just like, that really is you. I know yeah, you. Yeah. And I remember getting, getting choked up about it. And I go into, uh, I get into the pew and this, this lovely friend of ours says, um, says, Oh, hi, Joseph. This is so and so. This is so and so. She goes, and of course, you know my Jesus. Oh yeah, god! So lost it at that point because I'm like, yes, <laughs> yes, and yet I don't know wow. him. You know. Wow. Uh, so anyway, that kind of you're you're toast at that point, and yeah, you know, and and it was in that moment when I realized kind of what the Eucharist is that two things happened. One thing that happened is all of my previous uh, objections to the Catholic faith kind of I don't know how to describe it, but they kind of congealed in the Eucharist, like. Um, Turning the incarnation, I'm turning my understanding of the incarnation on its head through an understanding of the Eucharist made all these other problems, these misunderstandings of grace, these misunderstandings of um, uh, sanctification and, and, and penance and indulgences yeah, yeah, and yeah. just everything about Catholic soteriology just kind of all of a sudden made sense. Even angels and demons, the way we see uh, those just all started to make sense. And the second thing that happened when I had this kind of experience was that I realized um, there's no choice for me anymore. Yeah. Um, I don't have a choice anymore. If I say I love Jesus and I don't follow him because I've discovered that he's there in the tabernacle of every church, uh, Catholic church, and I don't become Catholic, I don't love him. And it's hard for a lot of my Protestant friends and family to understand that. They think, oh, what, you've seen the light and we haven't? <sighs> what do you say to that? Yeah. You know, um, yes, no. You know, yeah, you're you're much holier than I am. But somehow I've seen this to be true. And you have to imagine a parallel universe in which I'm right. And if I'm right, and the Eucharist is what the church says uh, it is, or who the church says it is, um, 
then I don't have a choice. Yeah. If it's if they're wrong, yeah. and I'm worshiping a piece of bread, then I'm uh, you know a, a demonic uh, idolater. Otherwise, there's no choice. So that happened. Uh, it was in 2010. Um, again, on September 29th, 19, uh, sorry, uh, 2010, that I became Catholic. My my wonderful wife, uh, who's a very holy woman and who will probably get to heaven before me, even though she'll probably survive me, um, did not join with me, and that was 13 years ago. Um, we have uh, we have seven children, and uh, none of them are Catholic. Um, and, of course, that breaks my heart, um, and it causes a whole bunch of predictable problems. Uh, in every area of life, but uh, here I am, and uh, I would not trade the Eucharist for anything, even a even a religiously united family, which is yeah. the thing I desire the most after the Eucharist. And along the way, um, there were definitely, you know, I'm skipping over a whole bunch of steps where there were people who came into my life and made, uh, you know, give me, you know, pr provided amazing uh, insight or influences. Um, so I don't know how much you want to get into each one of those, but, uh, you know, somebody said to me once, uh, what made you, who made you Catholic? And I said, everybody, first I say Jesus, <laughs> first I say Jesus. Yeah. And then I say, yeah, but who was like accompanied you on the way? I'm like everybody, because at one point I realized every Protestant and Catholic that I met who was holy was, was pushing me along uh, the journey to Rome. Yeah. You know, uh, the, the person I was mentioning earlier, I guess it's not, no problem saying her name is Anya. Um, you know, she was an enormous influence. Um, she was the first Catholic who ever out Bibled me because of course I was among the Protestants who thought that Catholics don't know their Bible. Um, and they largely don't, but boy, does she ever. And, um, you know, my, my, uh, my friend, uh, my friend Gregory, uh, who was also a, um, a convert from the Pentecostal Assemblies of Canada uh, a little bit earlier than I was. Uh, he, he was an amazing help. Um, and I even say my parents were an amazing help. You know, my, my mom taught me, my dad taught me to love Jesus more than anything else and to follow where he led no matter what it cost. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Uh, I will not pretend that I do that at all times, but this was a big thing and couldn't say no. Yeah. Yeah. And of course, so a lot of saints helped me along the way, right? A lot of, a lot of friendships with, um, uh, especially Our Lady. You know, I remember praying the rosary and hoping that I wasn't committing idolatry for the first time. Um, St. Joseph, who's, by the way, the reason I, I usually go by Joe or Joseph now, I was confirmed under that name as well. Not because it was given to me at birth, but because it, I chose it because of St. Joseph. Um, and a bunch of other, you and I share one uh, special devotion to uh, St. Francis de Sale. Yeah. Indeed. Um, he was a he was a, a guy who who helped me along the way. Saint Augustine, Saint Bonaventure, Saint Thomas Aquinas, yeah, and a bunch of the early church fathers too. Oh, and Saint Andre Bissette was a huge one for me. Yeah, I was gonna say, yeah, yeah. You, you know why? Because well, I'm mean, I'm a Saint Joseph devotee first of all, but um, but the second of all is is because uh, all the other saints that I'm friends with, I kind of have to use my brain <laughs> to access. <laughs> But he's my one friend in heaven, that, or one of the few friends in heaven. That I don't really need to use my brain. I just, I'm just, he's just there with me, yeah. kind of sits with me, especially when I'm talking to somebody who's hurting. You know, he's there with me. And I always ask him for prayer if I'm praying for somebody who needs healing, that kind of thing. <laughs> so lots of saints. That's beautiful. And some people that, that we have in common, I think, are yeah. kind of fascinating. So I'm thinking back to, uh, you know, I always start this show, uh, Joseph, by by talking about the, the instance that that kind of put me onto that that uh, the road to Catholicism, and it was this you know this Protestant evangelical pastor who I was working for, I, I was interning for at this student church in Waterloo, and and I went to Bible college with him. And this is the thing. So one, you know, he called me to his office one day. And says to me, "Hey, you know, I, I, I'm I'm going to this course. We're we're doing this stuff. You know what? What do you think? What do you think is more important, the Bible or tradition?" Was the question he asked me. And in hindsight, it's kind of a weird question because they don't have to pit those things together necessarily. But, but I, I said, "Well, of course, the Bible, because right? that's the answer that every every evangelical is taught to give is is Jesus or the Bible is the Sunday school answer, right?" So I say the Bible. 
And then he says, yeah, he was ready for this answer. He was right. He, he's the kind of guy, <laughs> you know this, right? He, he's got the next, the next question and answer lined up, but he's thinking like two steps ahead. And he said, yeah, but who put the Bible together? And I went, oh yeah, who did? Right. And here I was like, I mean, I became, I became an evangelical Christian at the age of 15. So I'd been, I'd been many years at this point as an evangelical Christian. I, I, I loved my Bible. I loved, I was taking undergrad level church history courses at the university. And here I was stumped by a question like that because I hadn't thought about, well, yeah, exa- how did it get put together exactly? Like, I, you know, you, I, I assumed, well, it's there. It's, it's bound between those two leather back. You know, pieces of leather, <laughs> right? So, Zondervan. so, it, it, Zondervan yeah, said Zondervan. so, <laughs> so, so, well, who put it together? And I, and, and he goes, wasn't that tradition? And I thought, well, yeah, I guess it was. So is that, is that more important? Because like, that kind of helped to put the Bible together. And, and not just quite, any tradition. Well, that, that was the thing, right? And so I began to look into, this was a 2007, 2008, I think. So I don't know where you were at this point. I think you were in this class with this guy, with this guy maybe at this point. But No, that was 10 years prior. I'm that, old. <laughs> yeah, that, that, you know, that threw me for a loop, right? And I, and I didn't know how to, how to understand that. And I, and I began then to, to slowly unpack those questions, right? And I, and I began, you know, I, I began looking at Protestant sources. Okay, so so what do what do Protestants say about this? How do Protestants understand this this history? Because I, I was Protestant, right? And I kept running into a lot of claims made about okay, the Catholic Church down through the ages here, this and this, that didn't kind of square up. They kept, they kept leaving me like, there's got to be more than this. This doesn't quite make sense. These these claims don't quite make sense, right? And of course, like you did began to read from the church fathers. I discovered the church fathers and thought, wait, wait a minute. There's, I wasn't taking a master's level course like, like you were, Joseph. Uh, I, I, in my, I, in my own uh, feeble uh, edumacation, stumbled into these things that, that I realized were called the, the church fathers and the, you know, the apostolic fathers. And I couldn't believe all of the pages and pages and pages of, of writing we have from the guys who were in many cases hearers of the apostles, right? And I'm encountering things like you encountered. You know, one thing that stopped me in my tracks was, f- first of all, you know, Ignat- Ignatius of Antioch talking about the bishop. You know, where the where the mm-hmm. bishop is, that's where the church is. And I went, what do you mean? I don't have mm-hmm. a bishop. Where my my church yeah. is like down the street. We don't have a bishop. We have nothing in the Pentecostal church that talks about bishops like that right and and why why was it important that the uh the church is where the bishop was because only the bishop or those assisting yeah. him yeah. should consecrate the Eucharist. yes yes and then i read that one of the ways that t- to identify you know a non-christian a, a heretic was that they don't they don't profess the Eucharist as the body and blood of, of Christ, the same flesh that hung and suffered on the cross. So we're not talking, we're not talking metaphorically here, symbolically here, right? This is the, the, the same. And I went, wait, we don't, what? We don't, <laughs> we don't believe that. And I thought, well, why did that change? Right? And then you begin to, you begin to kind of. Or did it change? Yeah. And then I realized, wait a minute, it 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 didn't change in this in this church over here. They still believe they still believe this. And then I began to read from, say, you know, Catholic sources, not about the Catholic Church, but the Catholic Church itself, writing writing right in its own authority and its own words from from those who were within the church. And I realized, as I often say in the intro to the show, Joe, that what I thought I knew about the Catholic faith was was based on these misunderstandings. Right? I don't know uh, why people think that that's okay. Like, I mean, a, another good convert convert friend of mine from the PAOC, another Bible college uh, classmate, said uh, he he said it right. He said, uh, "Why do people go to Toyota to ask about a Chrysler?" Yeah, right, <laughs> right, right. Because you know, and I guess I guess I was I was comfortable right in the evangelical sources. First of all, right, I it was okay to read about the Catholics as long as I was reading about them from my own camp. Right, I felt safe doing it that way. Yep. But 
the misunderstandings that I that I heaped up, right? And it, and it wasn't like you talked about, and I had this experience too in certain places, like just just misinformation, like like almost yeah. will almost willfully kind of blind or sometimes just misleading. Like we're gonna say this, we're gonna say it as if it's true. And even though it probably isn't, we don't we don't care to look into it. There's a couple of YouTubers who were like this. And years ago, I, I lost my hat over it, and I really would have, <laughs> in, in less, less mature moments, really wanted to respond to some of these <laughs> the comments out there, right? That are, <laughs> wait a minute, if you just looked into this, you would know this isn't true. But you're saying this as if it's true, and it really bugged me. But I encountered yeah. a lot of that, you know, as an, even as a Pentecostal in my younger years. But more often than not, it was people who just were misinformed and weren't trying to maliciously mislead people, just really didn't know what they're talking about. And were then spreading that, I was receiving that because it was safe. It felt okay in my own camp, right? But then you, you begin to venture out and read Catholic theologians, read the catechism, you know, read St. Francis de Sales, these fabulous saints that St. Augustine, right? St. Jerome, the, the writings of these saints that were thoroughly Catholic who, who write with authority and, like you say, Joe, again and again, bring it back to the, the Eucharist and the bishop and these things, it, it, it begins to at least force you to kind of begin to ask questions. And when I'm, you know, when, my, when that, that even Uncle Pastor was coming back to his office after a night class or whatever, after a class at Bible college studying patristics, he was thinking of his upbringing as a, as a Catholic because he was raised in Montreal as an Italian Catholic and would come back and wrestle with, well, here's what, I, what I'm what i trying to drive with my upbringing and what I'm learning here in my current status as an evangelical pastor and, and the early church. And I was his sounding, I was his sounding board, I think in many cases. And years later, when I had gone down this journey, right? I'd read the things you'd read. I'd read the patristics. I, YouTube was beginning to be a thing back in, at this time. And I remembered something across, you know, RCAA videos that uh, Father John Ricardo was putting out through mm -hmm. Our Lady of Good Counsel Parish in Michigan. These hours and hours of just rich theological teaching. And I was like, I was in heaven. I was binge watching these in secret. Like my wife would go to bed before we had kids. I'd be up till three in the morning. <laughs> really? I didn't yes, know this. <laughs> I'd be up till three in the morning on YouTube. Uh, you know, no, nothing inappropriate. Just binge watching the, the the religious videos. Right? Thank goodness. Uh, <laughs> but, you know, but it was it was it was equally scandalous because because here I was yeah. in secret, kind of like devouring the Catholic faith, and and I I can remember like I. I got to a point where I said, "Hey, look, I've been, I've been on this journey," and she knew uh, she knew a lot about it, but I hadn't really been openly sharing what I was thinking with her. And I got to a point where I said to her, "I'm this is where I'm at. I'm thinking I'm thinking of I got to become Catholic." And I waited way too long. I know now, after years of doing this show, that I made the mistake that many of us, uh, often the male convert, makes and waiting just way too long to tell your spouse, what you were thinking this whole time. And I, I dropped that bombshell on her and it, that went awfully, it went as you can imagine it went. Uh, yeah. And I, I know that story. Yes. And I went to one of the, you know, one of the suggestions that she made, well, well let's talk to this guy you knew, this pastor that you knew the, from years ago, who first got you on this journey. And I went to, I went to see him and actually in the same town that we live in now, uh, is where he lived at the time with his wife, which is funny because we're back here in a coffee shop, just you know, you know, ten minutes away from where I'm sitting here. I met him one Saturday morning. We were in town visiting, and we sat down, and I said, "Hey, look, this journey began years back when you got this, asked me this question, right? And now I'm at the door of the Catholic Church. Stop me! What? Stop me! Like this is you're the last hope." And it was many of my friends, my wife included, kind of said. He'll tell you, he'll talk you out of it. Like, they'll, you know, they, he'll stop you because he, you know, he would, he didn't become Catholic. He's still an evangelical pastor, right? He got you on this path and, and he'll stop you. And I went and I saw him and I said, what do you say? Stop me. And all he said to me, Joe, was he said, listen, I got a friend who way back when we were in class together, you know, he, was asking questions like this. I was asking questions like, you know, he became Catholic and he would say, don't do it. It's too hard. It fractures your family. It's too complicated. Like that's, don't do it. And I looked at him and I said, 
Real, the only reason I shouldn't become Catholic is because a guy you knew has a hard time with, with, with his family. Now, that's understating it, I, I think, in hindsight, because it, it, that's challenging. I'm not going to downplay that. But sitting there, I thought, that's not a good enough reason, though, not to, not to go where I can receive the Eucharist and where Jesus is present in the Eucharist and I can have that. That's not going to stop me. And I walked out feeling kind of defeated, kind of, you know, I, I kind of had hoped he'd had something substantial to slow me down or to, uh, to redirect me. And I thought, well, I guess that's it. Like, that's the last, if that's all he's got, I'm becoming Catholic, right? And I did. I know that story. I did. Meaning, meaning I lived it as well. I get it. <laughs> yeah. And I, so I became Catholic and my wife became Catholic. Thanks be to God. Not the case I know Praise for God. everybody, right? Mm -hmm. the, a year later. Uh, no, thanks, no small part to Our Lady, who I, I prayed my first Miriam prayer the night that I told her I was thinking of becoming Catholic. We had a great big fight. We don't, we don't fight often like, the, like this. Great big fight. I slept on the couch that night, and it was just like a, it was, it was fireworks. And I said my first, you know, prayer to Mary. Mary, hey, if, if you're, if you, you can hear my prayers, please pray for me. Like this seems hopeless situation, and really, it felt absolutely hopeless. And uh, right, and the next morning. As early as the next morning, my wife came up and said, you know what? I spent all last night looking at the Catholic Church, and I, you're not so wrong after all. And I went, <laughs> wait wow. a minute. We, we I didn't went, know that she did that you know, on her own. Yeah, we, well, we, went from, we went from, honestly, Joey, th there I go, Joey, honestly, Joseph, fe feeling you know totally hopeless the one night, saying this prayer, and the next morning, I, I, not, not a complete, like nothing was magically solved the next morning, but... The, the distance between the night before and the next morning was astronomical mm. in that mm. in, the, in that movement. To hear, I thought, never, never f for a minute ever in her life will she consider this. To the next day was 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 just that even a small moment movement felt like astronomical. After that that prayer, asking a saint to help me and pray for me, right? So that guard was down quite fast. The, the, my my problem with Mary was solved quite quickly when. With that, you know, that kind of a rush of an answer of a prayer, like so powerful like that was... That's often the last thing to go for a lot of converts. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I and mean, it was it was easy in that sense for me. But then, so I'm beginning to discern, okay? Here's you come back in the story. It's, I think it's really fascinating, Joey. Joey. <laughs> yeah. okay. I, was, I can't okay. stop, can't <laughs> stop, won't stop. But I, I, I remember <laughs> I, was, I was on the way to discerning how to get into the Catholic Church. I had no idea how to even actually become Catholic. And I was at this little, this little basement uh, at, at St. Anne's, actually, in Kitchener. I'll, I'll say it because you, you probably know what I'm talking about. And it was this little kind of, I don't even know what, what they framed it as, but it was like a little parish talk. And I thought, oh, cool, like a Bible study kind of thing. And down the street from where we lived at the time, like, I, I could walk down there, and I did. And I got there, and I met some pretty awesome people who kind of sat with me, and I told them a bit of my story. They're like, wait, you're not Catholic? I'm like, no, 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 I, I'm thinking of becoming Catholic, though. I'm on this, I'm on this, this journey, and they go, oh, you got to meet this guy we know. You got to meet this guy called, you got to meet this, this Joey guy. And so, so I don't know if you remember this, Joe, but so they, ga they gave me a, this, this number. I think I texted you, and we met up on like a Saturday morning. At a Tim Hortons, a coffee chain up here, up here in Canada, and it didn't take long, if I remember correctly, before we realized that we had had this weird story in common, where this guy that you knew in this course on like patristics or whatever, who was, you know, who was, you were asking questions to serve in the Catholic faith. He was obviously <laughs> asking questions and then bouncing these questions off of off of me at a later date. And we had, you know, we had, I became Catholic kind of tangentially through like your journey and conversations, I think, with him. And that like, it's this really weird kind of triangle and then circle around. Well, I, I had to be like, I must have been the one that he was referring to when he said, oh, I have a friend you, who became well, you Catholic were. and had family you were. issues. You were. Yeah, okay. And I met you and I said, I think you're this guy. We discerned, we kind of figured this out. And I remember you going, I would never say that. If you asked me, I would have said, yeah, you got to become Catholic. Like as hard as it is for me, as hard as, you know, you, of course, I wouldn't have given you that advice that he, that he gave you. 
<laughs> right? All, all those years later. So you've been looking for, you were looking for a lot of reasons to not proceed in that journey. Yeah. Yeah. And, and everyone using, you looked for. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. I know that story for sure. And you know, he, <laughs> so I, it's just a fascinating kind of the way those things weave together, I think. Right. You know, I, 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 I don't know where, were you, were you guys bouncing like ideas off of, if you remember that time, I don't know, was, um, what, was, was this something that when you talk to this guy, was it, did it seem like he was going through a thing? Cause the end I was, was getting and I would, <laughs> was, yeah. was there's a lot of wheels turning there and I was getting, and I was getting all the, uh, all the like I, I was a I was a springboard for these kind of conversations I think the the what the I don't know what do you call that the the punching bag, right yeah, or the tackle dummy yes <laughs> yeah yeah no I, I know I know what you mean yes there were things you know what I can't speak for him um I knew him quite well but yeah, um, yeah yeah you know we were friends um but and I I would even go as far as to say that there was a period of time where our paths were in going in the same direction. Yeah. Um, you know, perpendicular to the Tiber River. And um and I and I have I have lots of speculation as to why he kind of uh sure, sure. abandoned that path, but it's not for me to say. Uh I, I do know this. I do know that if I had gotten any more experience in ministry, uh, and there were some areas in which I well, you know what, we everybody excels at something and you know is weak at something else. The, the areas in which I was strong, you know, there's a lot of promise there for yeah, movement, yeah, yeah, upward movement, uh, deeper movement, uh, a lot of affirmation, a lot of, um, um, yeah, there's even, you know, there's even, there was money, there, there was attractiveness about the kinds of things that were before me to do. And it's a mercy, I'll say, just because of my own human weakness, it's a mercy that God allowed me to uh, be received into commun- full communion with the Catholic Church. Um, before some of those things really came to fruition. Um, you know, there were definitely were some things that I had to give up, like significant things, but I, w- I wasn't as far down the road of, um, of being successful in, uh, in ministry where it would be excruciating. Yeah. Um, yeah. So, you know, again, I don't want to speculate about anybody's reasons for abandoning yeah. that yeah. path. And you know what? Nobody has permanently abandoned it until they're pronounced dead. Yeah. So, <laughs> um, I just pray that I have the grace not to do so myself. Right. Yeah. Um, I don't have, I have no temptations right now to leave the Catholic church, but you know, every time I sin, uh, I'm, 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 I'm saying no to Jesus. You know, yeah. um, my experience in, in confession is sometimes, um, is sometimes, uh, you know, well, it's, 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 it's rack, it's like a racking sobs sometimes because it's like, yeah. how can I say I love Jesus, uh, when I crucify him every day? Sure. And uh, and uh, why did I say that? Just because I'm acknowledging just the incredible weakness. Like it's hard to say. Some someone will say from from my old world. You know, you're very prideful. You're arrogant to say that you received this special revelation that none of us received. One one of my relatives even pointed to another relative of ours that said, you know, you think you're holier than him, and <laughs> and he's a remarkably holy guy. Yeah. Um, and uh, like, you, you, there's no way, like, you know, she called me Joey too. <laughs> there's no way, Joey, that you're, you know, like, what do you, what do you think? And you're giving yourself airs. How do you explain to somebody that, that doing something like this is actually very humble because you're admitting that you're wrong? Yes. Yeah. Uh, I think that that's, that's a Chestertonian concept too. Yeah. How do you, you know, how, you don't go for uh, and shout from the rooftops. I'm so humble, you know, and yet. So you, so when somebody says you're arrogant uh, and you've done this because you're arrogant, sometimes the best response is yeah, yeah, I, you know, you know, may a may a maxima culpa, you know, yeah. and may God have mercy on my soul. Yeah, right. You're right. I'm arrogant and I'm prideful. God save me. And in my heart, I'm although I'm agreeing with what they're saying, I'm not agreeing with what they're saying. <laughs> so, yes, I am prideful and arrogant, like anybody who's ever sinned, but not because of why you say. Yeah. So uh, you, you learn you learn different little tricks um, on on your in your journey dealing with people who strongly disagree with your conversion. Little tricks to sort of make yourself at ease and also avoid saying something you'll regret. Yeah. Yes. Not like I haven't said things I regret, but 
<laughs> yeah. I, you, you know, the, the litany of humility is, mm. is, uh, very powerful. I, for a while, and I should get back to this practice, honestly, Joe, uh, saying that every day. Right. And, and one of those, one of those lines, if I remember correctly is, you know, I don't want to be, it, it, I'll, uh, to paraphrase, right. Not getting caught up in being understood properly all the time. Yeah. From like, the desire okay. of being understood, right. Lord Jesus delivered. Yes. Yeah. You, know, you know it. You know it. Yeah. Oh, I know that one. prayer. Right. It's because right in my, my book, <laughs> that, that, that is the right. And we, before we, I hit record, you were talking about this too, Joe, the idea that you could, gosh, you could write your manifesto, right? And I spent four and a half years on this show bringing, you know, explaining the Catholic faith, sharing stories like yours, uh, sharing bits of my own. I, I've written for longer than that uh, uh, on the internet, you know, blogging articles and stuff. And and you can still be misunderstood, even if you write your whole your whole life story exactly how you want it to, do, want it to be, you can still be misunderstood misunderstood and not understood how you want to be understood right by catholics and, and protestants alike yes yes right i mean i re recently encountered an incident where people or you know where somebody was was kind of frustrated with me because it seemed like well i used to be evangelical and now i'm catholic so i'm so much better than those evangelicals but like that's no that's not that's not at all what, I, what I'm trying to say or trying to do or trying to live. Like you say, I, it's a humbling thing to have to have said, I think I was wrong. And I think I have this figured out this way now. And here are my reasons why, kind of presenting this in humility and cordially, but I misunderstood, right? And I, and I, that, that racks me, that hurts me, that, that's hard to be yeah. misunderstood like that. But, you know, Lord, deliver me from, from, from needing to be, to be understood, right? Because I, I can't. I, I, you can't, right? You you get uh, you'll get judged um, even from Catholics who almost think. I met I met a couple, like a married couple, who almost think there shouldn't be converts, yeah. right? Like, uh, who are you to say that you should you should convert? Um, and then another, even another Catholic. I was giving a talk one time in a parish and. Uh, this I described myself as you know because I said I was an evangelical Protestant. I said now I'm I'm evangelical but not Protestant. And uh, you know during question time, this uh, this lady challenged me so hard. She's like, "How can you say you're still evangelical? How can you say that?" I said, "Well, because I'm you know kind of gave the the Catholic understanding of yes, yes. Uh, of what evangelical means in in different contexts. You know I'm very very much gospel centered or I endeavor to be." She goes, "Yeah, but you said evangelical. You're trying to compromise." Them. No. <laughs> I'm 100% Catholic, yeah. like I, I'm to the point of, <clears throat> I'm to the point of uh, like I, I can echo Ignatius of uh, Loyola, who basically, in paraphrasing, uh, said, you know, if I see something as black and the church says it's white, it's white. Yeah. You know. Yeah. Um, I'm almost, I'm like I'm to that point, mind you. The church has to officially say so <laughs> in a way that is undeniably dogmatic, because <laughs> if I went, if I went that direction, uh, well. The current confusion in the church would uh, send me down a, a road I don't want to go down. So, <laughs> but uh, yeah, you'll get opposition from all sides. Remember, you were you were saying um, that you were looking for people to convince you to stop your journey. Yeah, I sort of did as well. I mean, I was talking to a lot of Catholics and Orthodox as well, Orthodox Christians, um, and uh, it was actually my my friends and family who dragged me in front of people who were to convince me to stop. Um, and the reason for that <clears throat> is because I had done all of my, my research was all primary literature because I generally like to stay away from those who want to, you know, digest and regurgitate material for me. I, I want to go to the sources. I want to yeah. go to the ideas yeah. uh, where the ideas originated. And most importantly, the authorities, the authority figures, the apostles, the people who learned the faith from them, the people through whom like that's literally your straw uh, that you're, you know, that you're breathing through while you're underwater. It's literally your your life source. This is where it's uh, Jude verse three, you know, uh, that you should we should eagerly contend for the faith that was once for all handed down to the uh, to the saints. Yeah, um, yeah, that's our that's our life straw. So do that. Uh, so I was really focused on that, and I I read some theologians. Uh, I can name, you know, a few were very very influential on me. Uh, uh, Hans von Balthasar. Yes, uh, for my trad friends. Yes, he actually helped me become Catholic and become a trad a traditionalist. Um, uh, you know, Ratzinger, um, 
there were others, you know, uh, oh, it was, there's a book there by uh, uh, Pierre de Chardin um, and others as well. Even some of those who would be described as sort of part of the uh, conciliar kind of liberal crowd um, actually helped me because they were there's such depths of theology, even on the, you know, anyway, all I'm saying is I was doing that kind of research, that kind of reading, that kind of, I wasn't really into the um, sort of the popular uh, Catholic writers at the time. I did later on become a fan of people like Scott Hahn, like, you know, who you've had on the show. Um, but it was my friends and family dragging me in front of people who were to convince me. So it was my, my mother, God bless her soul. Like she just, she cares about me. Right. So <laughs> she doesn't want me to go to hell. So she, uh, she dragged me in front of two people. One, who, one of whom was the second in command of our denomination. Yeah. yeah um, and yeah. the other of whom was an old Bible college prof of mine who had a PhD in patristics. Um, so you'd think that those would, if anyone's going to convince me, it's going to be those guys, right? Who they know me, they know me for a long time, and they have the cred credentials to be able to stop me. Well, when it came to the uh, the the prof, he would basically he said things uh, to argue me out of becoming Catholic that were patently false. Yeah, and I said, "Oh no!" And I addressed him my name, like Professor, like you know that. He said that there was a word that didn't occur before AD 200 or whatever. I said, well, actually, so-and-so, like, like Tertullian said it, and, you know, like, that that's not true. And he goes, oh, I guess you're right. Oh, and no. and I was just like, how how is how is this guy, I mean, at the time, this how how is that, how I'm correcting you, right? I honestly think there's some willful <laughs> ignorance on the part of some of these authorities, um, especially since, you know, acknowledging the truth just – makes obvious what you then have to uh, change in your life anyway. And then the, the other guy who's the authority in the PAOC, he basically handed me some articles by former nuns and priests. Yes, of course. And the priest ones always had SJ after their names too. And, uh, <laughs> and you know, and so like, here, look at these former nuns and priests who expose the evil of the Catholic church. And I go like, and I said, said his name, you can't possibly think that these disgruntled former you know, Catholics are in any way <laughs> like reliable. Yeah. And uh, so I was just shocked at the, at the paucity of evidence that these people who were supposed to turn me around yeah. Yeah. gave just, just nothing. Yeah. 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 And, and lots of challenges I, since too, you know? <laughs> yeah. Well, speaking of challenges since, I mean, our story continues, uh, Joe. Oh, yeah. I mean, last time that we sat down together, we sat down around a blazing fire I think you'd thrown, I don't know you threw, what you even threw in there. I feel like it was, I, in my mind, it was a gigantic fire. Had a couple of beers and looked out over, over the river that runs through your property. Pretty idyllic. Yeah. I can remember some chickens in the background kind yeah. of making some noise. I don't know. I don't, know I, don't had, I don't think you had any goats or anything at this time. But I, I, I may not have, that time. There may have been some goats involved. I'm not sure. And uh, we, were, we were there because a bombshell a bomb had gone off in both of our lives, uh, the same bomb, um, because we, it was, I'll, I'll sit back for a second here. It was a joy to re-encounter you again, right? So I became Catholic, my wife became Catholic a year after I did. We lived for a bit, a, a bit away from you. I mean, the same, the same region, not too far away. And I saw you, I should say this too, okay, this is an aside, but this is, this is powerfully, powerful and important, I think, to mention, Joe. What I say before that, that my devotion to Our Lady, the Blessed Virgin Mary, kind of uh, became easier after that moment of, of prayer. Uh, it wasn't wasn't like overnight easy, right? It became easier, certainly. But I still didn't quite understand the rosary, and I still had some reservations and had to read a bunch more books from good theologians about Mary to understand the development of the of uh, of you know the Marian practice in the Catholic Church and where these things came from and the their their different roots. But one thing that really affected me and and I mentioned this a lot on the show. I've mentioned it before for sure. Is I can remember coming into there was this Catholic men's group that I somehow stumbled into. I don't I don't even think it was you that brought me in there, Joe. I don't know. Maybe it was. Uh, maybe it was. I don't know how I first got in there, but you were in this group, Joe. And I remember walking into this church downtown Kitchener and seeing like 10 grown men from all different walks of life, right? Yeah. 
some big tough guys like yourself, like other all kinds of other guys, right? Guys in suits, guys in jeans, all kinds of different whatever, different walks of life, on their knees, praying the rosary. And I was, that was such a powerful, like moment for me, that witness. I remember. And I thought, gosh, golly, there's something in this that I don't quite understand yet. If this brings all these guys who are smart guys from all different walks of life to their knees to pray this prayer together, there's something deep in this. And that like, I mean, that was profound. I don't know, I don't think I was even Catholic yet when I first began to attend that group. I, I, don't, I don't think that I was. I don't think and, you were either. And, and there and I remember you telling me that. Yes. There was after, like this, after the event, you said like, yes. well, is, how is this masculine? And, and it, it really works. Yeah. It was just, it was so powerful to see that. Right. So that really moved the needle, you know, big time mm. in my understanding mm. of the rosary and, and, and Marian, Marian devotion. So, you know, I, I encountered in that group and that group was very important for me for a while, for many years, uh, going to that group once in a while. Um, not not as regular, I think, uh, as you attended, but met some great guys in, in that group. And we, I don't know, we weren't in super great touch, but had the, the, the incredible blessing of then re-encountering you because we moved our family to the parish where you were working at this center as, this, as the university chaplain you know, at, at this parish. And I thought, this is awesome. There, there's this, there's Joe, right? And we, and we kind of reconnected on that level. And then a bombshell went off. In our, li- in our lives. Well, COVID hit, and that was painful enough. But in, in the middle of, of, you know, of that, um, and, you know, I'll put it this way. I was teaching RCIA in that, in that parish. We had moved, my wife and I, because our parish priest was, was reassigned to this new church. And it was closer to us anyway, so it made sense to move. Uh, but it was a challenge. You know, that, that, that was a discernment for us in that we were had decided to follow this, you know, our, our pastor to a new church, leave our friend group at this first church, leave the church that my wife was brought into the church in, where our son was baptized, and had developed some friendships there. But we bought into a vision that that this pastor had. And when he was moved, you know, him and I sat down a bunch and chatted about it and kind of, you know, I, again, I was a kind of a, a sounding board for, for another, you know, another, per, another clergy member, right? And it's working through their ideas. And I said, you know what? I got a friend, Joe, at that church, actually, who's an awesome guy. He's the campus minister there. That, that's awesome. I, I, that's a cool move. This seems like a, like a really good fit, you know, for a pastor who had, you know, truly outgrown the parish we were in. Like we were in a tiny little church. And just bursting at the seams of things that were going on because this pastor was, you know, had had some pretty cool vision. So we, we, you know, we followed that, and came in and me and you kind of reconnected. You know, at, we were in the same church together, doing stuff. I was teaching RCIA, and because it was a, it was COVID that year, things were shut down, and we had had to delay the the right of, uh, you know delay the Easter Vigil, essentially, right? Like the things closed down just before the Easter Vigil. And so there was no, there was no Vigil Mass to bring in these new candidates to the church. So here was RCIA kind of truncated. <clears throat> and we did this kind of truncated ceremony, I think it was in July, right? After yep. things opened up in a first small stage up here in Canada, much later than many places in, in uh, elsewhere in the world, but uh, that, that, that's, that's beside the point. Opened up. We could have a small ceremony with you know a few guests. Uh, did this? Brought in these new candidates to the church after a long time of waiting. You know, my first RCA program as the guy leading the program. I was like, yes, okay, done and dusted. We got it. Like now, now what's next? Get these guys connected to the church. Get this thing. Get these guys you know invested. It really involved and and maintaining their faith. And uh, and the world exploded or it imploded, right? Um, yeah. which from my perspective, you know, you have your own perspective because you, <laughs> this involves you too, but ended in, uh, I think you put the, I think you, I think I can put it this way, you know, a priest being laicized for the reasons where that priests get laicized for, right? In the end. And sadly, our, our you know, our stories 
are connected <laughs> in our conversions, but also in this kind of world imploding kind of incident disaster all those years later, right? The thing, the thing that so many converts fear and so many con people who are converting, those around them fear. I can remember, you know, first stepping my toes into the, the church, many people were stopping me and saying, do you, do you, are you sure? Look at, look at the scandals. Look at the, look at the, 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 the rate of, of abuse amongst priests and, and priests doing wacky kind of things. And are you sure you want to, want to do that? And want to have kids someday and expose kids to that and expose your family to these kind of sufferings. And, and, and I always waved right in my ignorance and my, in my, maybe my arrogance, ah, it can't happen to me. Can't happen to us. Won't happen. And that thing that, that, that is feared by many who are <laughs> looking to conversion happens, right? And the world kind of implodes. Yeah. Incredibly you, painful experience. And the last time but, we were together. That challenge your faith. <laughs> well, yeah, the last time we were in together person, was around we, the fire. We sat there and, this, and yeah. that's where we were. Kind well, of trying to just piece happened. together. Yeah. Trying to piece yeah, together. This, what, so it was, this, what it was this scandal that broke out, an abuse scandal that broke out. Um, or at least that's how it was you know, presented. And I remember you, you were sitting there around the fire with me and I, I don't want to put words in your mouth, but I, it was almost as though it was, um, I won't say it shook your faith, but it, it made you kind of reevaluate your entire, you know, sort of approach to participation in parish life. Yeah. Is that fair to say? Yeah. Yeah, no, it is because we had, we'd, we'd uprooted and we had, you know, we had moved following the vision of a visionary that then kind of crashed and burned. Right. And a lot of our, a lot of our identity in that parish and how we were currently practicing our faith was wrapped up in being part of establishing this vision and starting this new thing. And it seemed like this anointed thing that, you know, RCA was okay. I led that, you know, even in spite of COVID, I'd led that, that, that course, it had gone well. Let's do it again next year, even better. Now that COVID's passing us by, and uh, you know, what's next? What can we tackle kind of next? Right. And then that kind of just hit a brick wall. And yeah, was, that, we were certainly kind of going, well, what, what now? Right. And I remember is I told, that kind of a Protestant thing to, to really kind of, you know, dive deep into the work of a parish because of the vision of a particular pastor. Well, I feel like that's a Protestant. Uh, it's certainly. Thing. I'm, it's, I'm, I'm yeah. tempted to do it too. Yes, it certainly is. Yeah, I was just like I was sharing. I was sharing the Catholic faith with some Protestant uh, friends. I do this a lot, by the way, and uh, <laughs> just surprising. in fact today, like hours ago, before I kind of settled in to get ready for the podcast, um, you know, they were like they're caught up in this dynamic even way more than 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 you are, of course. Like, um, I'm making it sound like you were still Protestant. You weren't. <laughs> Uh, it, but this idea of getting caught up in, in the vision and the program of a parish, and that's really your primary expression of faith. And I kind of had to lay it down for them and said, look, if I lived in a place where the nearest Catholic church, uh, you know, there's, there's a Catholic church in town, but the next one is three hours away or something like that. And it was really my only choice. And it was one of these tepid, um, yeah, uh, yes, you know, yeah. tambourine waving, felt <laughs> banner, rainbow flag waving uh, church, uh parishes and then right across the street with this was this on fire spirit filled um you know protestant charismatic church or you know whatever and they're just doing great they have great fellowship great outreach dynamic uh, teaching and all this stuff 100 percent, without even a doubt in my mind i'd be going to the first one uh and he goes why I felt like that doesn't make any sense like he goes i know you like that's not you why and I said, because I'm not there for the pastor. Yeah, I'm not there yeah. for the people in the pew beside me. I'm there for Jesus. Yeah. I'm there for the sacraments that he gave to his church to extend his incarnation to us and uh, throughout time and space. And, uh, you know, I, I, I guess even, I guess I have to remind myself of that because I'm actually very, uh, I believe, really in, in getting behind uh, the ministry of, of, of your parish priest um, and really supporting and doing that kind of thing. But it's, it's really, you really got to remember that you're not there for him. Yeah. You know, you're there for Jesus. Yeah. And so even if he has terrible homilies and he himself is lukewarm in the faith and, 
you know, I work with a lot of priests now, so I've, I meet, I meet these guys. And I'm like, if I was in your parish, boy, it would really drive home that I go there for Jesus. <laughs> <laughs> and that's, yeah. And that's, yeah, that's, that's deeply true. Yeah. And that's a different, that's a different dynamic entirely, right? From many of the kind of church shopping kind of mentality. That, I, I, that sounds very kind of derogative. I don't mean it that way, but that's the mentality of many. And it certainly was my mentality, our mentality as evangelicals, right? You're looking for a church that meets your needs, that meets the needs of your family, that meets the needs of your your spirituality. It has good music and, and good good preaching and good uh, ministry for youth and for kids and like in these kinds of things, right? You you do that as an evangelical, and many times the theology is kind of secondary to the programming you're looking for in these things. It's not quite as it's important, not always quite as important if you agree on all the fine points of of their theology. I mean that's that's a completely different experience to how you do church in quotes like as a Catholic, right? I mean you can. You can look for those things, and I've had I've had great conversations on this show about that idea where no, you shouldn't feel like you're bound to go to a church when your kids get nothing from it, and when there's nothing for families, there's no families there, right? If you have an option of going somewhere else, you shouldn't feel like you're bound to to a certain church, Catholic church. If there's a Catholic church that does things that will like really enrich your family in a, in a better way. Right, but it's not it's not the same idea of I'm putting that first before any theology or before because I mean we're not there for those those things. Those are enriching things, but we're there in any Catholic church for, for Jesus, right? For the Eucharist, for the sac for the sacraments, right? It's a different mentality, maybe hard to understand from the outside too. Because I wouldn't have I, I would have gone, well that doesn't make any sense. You go, you go, but it's definitely a, a different thing. It's it's quintessentially Protestant. It's consummately Protestant to yeah. um, to church shop. Um, even if you're really faithful in one congregation for your whole life, you're still church shopping, right? Because you looked all around and you said, "This one suits me best," right? Whereas yeah, uh, it's yeah. just not. That's not the way it is. I could go to any Catholic church anywhere in the world. Good congregation, full, dynamic, and alive. Bad one. Good priest. Bad priest. I'm there for Jesus, like you say. But you know, all that matters is we all we all love Jesus, right, Keith? I mean, <laughs> how many times have you heard that from Protestant friends and family who just kind of want to make the discussion go away? You know what? We all believe in Jesus. Yeah. And I'm like, yeah. I, I'm always tempted to go, uh, really? Like you mean like like the Muslims and the Jehovah's Witnesses and the Mormons? We all love <laughs> Jesus. Well, you know what I mean. You know, you know what I mean. You have to believe He's God. And like oh so like like the Arians and the Nestorians and all the other heretics who also believed that Jesus was God. Well, you know what I mean. You have to. And then they start quoting some formula that sounds like a creed. Sure. And I'm like, wait a second. You know, I remember a very close relative of mine saying, "Nothing can be known dogmatically about Jesus except uh, what's in the Nicene Creed." And I'm like, <laughs> wait a why the Nicene Creed? <laughs> Like, why pick that particular document that the Catholic Church promulgated dogmatically? Why why that one? Why not some other one? I mean, it just blew my mind. Anyway, uh, uh, all this to say that uh, what Jesus are you pursuing? You know, what Jesus are you um, are, are you saying we all love? And yeah. and I always say when somebody says we worship the same God, I always say the difference between you and me is not in the word God. It's in the word worship. Worship. Yeah, yeah, we do something toward the same God. We both do something toward the same God. Uh, whether that's worship, I don't know if I can describe it like that. There's no worship without sacrifice. Yeah, well, that was and, uh, that was one of my first kind of before I even had a formally Catholic blog. I had a gosh, it was like a, it was one of those like this was the era of blogging, Joe, and it was one of those kind of like mindstream. I did. It I felt too. like whatever I felt like blogging blog. So it was sometimes yeah. politics, it was sometimes religion, it was sometimes reviews of movies or music that I happened to like. And I don't know who read it, but people, there were there were readers. And one of the first kind of dipping my toes into a Catholic argument was about like worship, right? And I said, and I was trying to like a thought experiment, like, okay, looking at my Sunday morning Pentecostal worship service, how, like, where, where are the roots of that? versus the roots of a Catholic mass. And I didn't actually know a lot about Catholic mass, but I knew that it was rooted 
in really an ancient liturgy and an ancient, you know, an ancient understanding of how we worship. And I was kind of comparing those worships, those, those quote unquote worship styles. And my conclusion of this thought experiment, like, yeah, I became Catholic like a decade after this, but you know, way back when was that the Catholics had a better claim to be worshiping properly than I had as a Pentecostal because they had deeper roots yeah. grounded in their, their form of worship. I didn't. I didn't do anything with that for ten, you know, for ten years, other than having, having it niggle away at my brain as I process mm. these things, right? Letting the Holy Spirit kind of begin to, to I don't know, whisper in my ear, or something. Yeah. But I concluded that way back then that that that, right? That that's what worship has always meant in the you know in the in the Old Testament, in the New Testament, into the in the early Church Fathers. Right down through down through the all the theologians of the church, up until the Reformation, when that kind of becomes mixed, how we understand that right sacrifice of the mass versus what's yep. happening there, and, and Zwingli comes along and entering in some symbolism and these kinds of things. That, but for that first fifteen hundred years of church history, the, the, and beyond in the Old Testament, of course, right, which all Christians can affirm, that's what worship meant. And that was one of those like wait wait a second sacrifice priesthood liturgy uh rules that if you transgress those in the liturgy there's severe consequences uh not blurring the lines between the priest uh, between the clergy and the laity um the authority the teaching authority of the people of god you know from the top down being integrated into the liturgy all of those things the hierarchical nature of the people of god all all translates into the catholic church more than any other Christian movement, with the possible exception of uh, of the Orthodox, um, yeah, you're right. And you know, it's it's one of the worst things that evangelical Protestants ever did uh, is uh, take the concept of the priesthood of all believers and turn that into something that uh, means that there's no distinction between the the ministering, cl- the ordained class, and and the, and the laity. Uh, it destroyed both. It destroyed both the concept of the laity and the concept of the priesthood. All that to say that, you know, you talk about worship styles. It's like, you know, one's worship and one isn't, <laughs> you know? Yeah, I know you yeah. were just using a handle to refer yeah. to it, but it's like, no, 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 no. If the, the worship of, of Yahweh from the very beginning, like going back to Cain and Abel, involves sacrifice yeah. and submission to authority. And if you don't do that, you're in trouble. You know, the very first act that that uh, the, the, our father in the faith, Abraham, uh, does is is, uh, is is build a, an altar, build a sac, you know, make a sacrifice. Uh, there's so many, in the, you know, uh, it, it's, it's true that Catholic worship is the modern, not modern, but the, uh, the the new covenant manifestation of Old Testament worship. There's just no question in my mind. Yeah, yeah and that it, you know. And it, it, you put all this together, man. It's, it's it's just hard to for me to even imagine how I thought before. Yeah, yeah. Like I'm glad I journaled a lot because I was like, oh yeah, I have to go back and like, I, I would read something in scripture and I'd journal about it because uh, it would hit me in a particular way. And I'm like, man, I mean, there's truth in what you just said, self, you know, twenty year old self. <laughs> but that's not what that means. <laughs> yeah. So. Yeah. Yeah. So I, I want to touch on one more thing that you said that I just that yeah. kind of floored me. And this was a while ago. You, you mentioned that when you were becoming Catholic, you were realized you were nostalgic for a thing you hadn't experienced before, yeah. uh, which I, I think you said that, and I got shivers down my spine earlier in this conversation, Joe, because that's exactly how that hit me. I, you know, I can remember beginning to look into the Catholic faith and, and hitting a moment where I think it probably was the moment where I realized I couldn't go back. I'd gone too far. I'd, I'd, I'd bought into, I understood what was happening here. And I'd recognized that this, as far as I could discern, was the church that Christ founded and continued on to today in the, in the sacraments, in, in the Eucharist, in the, in the priesthood. This was that church that Christ, that Christ founded in continuity. And it was still here. And I, I can feel that very viscerally, that, that nostalgia for this thing that I was never part of before. But when I, when I fixed that in my mind, it felt like I missed that and had been missing that for forever. 
And that makes yeah. sense in like a, this, a weird way, right? Because of course we're nostalgic for a time when the, when the faith was, was one, you know, united. We're nostalgic for when I could walk into a parish and see a priest in a Roman collar who could, who could, who was empowered by Christ through, you know, when he gave the apostles the power to bind and loose and pass down through time that this priest now in that parish is empowered to say, you know, Gee, I, I forgive you because Christ empowers me to say that. Right. There, yeah. th there's a, there's a deep sense that I missed a thing I never had <laughs> and, and encountering that and going, well, now I can do this. Now I can walk into that church and see a priest there. I can walk into a church and, and the Eucharist is there, our Lord on the, t on the altar during adoration and in mass, right? Yeah. It, it felt like, it You're felt like I'd always, that we should have always had. Yeah. And it felt like I, I, I knew that it felt like in some past lifetime, I had been, I had done those things and lived that life, but I had, yes. and I, don't, I don't believe in past lifetimes. No, but, but I, I know exactly what you mean. I mean, I mean, like, like there's, um, I remember even like in, in ministry, like, you know, leading worship and leading, like say communion. I remember, actually, this goes all the way back to like remembering uh, my first like baptismal services. And I was always very like, you know, I really hope they say it right. I really hope that, and you know, part of it, I just like the pomp and ceremony of it, but I was like, don't, don't take baptism lightly. Like you got to do this in the right way. And uh, you know, I cared about how the, pastor usually would say it and care about who was doing the baptizing and, and why and 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 then later on I remember in ministry it was uh uh I remember the most powerful times of of what I would have that time called worship um were you know times when we were evoking either scripture in high language or evoking kind of uh, ancient Christian formulae um you know Lord have mercy on us um, Jesus, Lord Jesus Christ, Son of the of, of the Living God, have mercy upon me, a sinner. These kinds of prayers or or formulas that would, or even a creed, uh, and it was like, oh, there's something there that I and I would never have associated it with the Catholic Church. Yeah, I yeah, just knew that yeah. something we're doing right now connects us back to this generations of Christians that go back to Christ, and this is our, the way in which we're participating in that. And I remember even uh, for a communion service. Um, I remember having the congregation uh, say the Apostles' Creed, and of course, I replaced the word Catholic with universal, yeah. as you're supposed to, <laughs> yeah. and um, which is not what that word means. But uh, I remember having them say, "Hey," that, and, I, and afterwards, people were coming up to me. It's like, "Why? Why this? Why the dead? Why the vain repetition? You know, we, we shouldn't be doing this. That, that's so Romish." And I'm like, "I wasn't trying to be Romish. I wasn't trying to be Catholic. I just thought this <laughs> this is what connects us to the ancient faith. Like, don't we believe that we connected back to the apostles? No, we're connected to the beginning of last century when Pentecost came. You know, they didn't say that. They, to be fair, they did not say that. <laughs> but you know, and I remember." Um, Oh my gosh, the worst! I actually got corrected by the senior pastor. I remember holding, you know, because you get the, and you have these plates with little, you know, stale saltine crackers, and then this tray with little thimble-sized cups yeah, of, yeah, of grape juice, juice yeah. Welch's. Amen. <laughs> and you hold them. Amen. Amen. I'm there. Yeah, absolutely. And I remember people would come by, and you know, you'd you'd, you'd whatever you'd, you'd take it and go back to your seat. Um, and I remember as people were taking it, I remember one time saying somebody would take this. And I used it more. It was more an Anglican formula. I said, uh, uh, the body of Christ, the bread of heaven, as they would take it. And then I would say, the blood of Christ, uh, drink and be thankful that your things are, your sins are gone. You know, and people were looking at me like, what are you doing right now? Because for a lot of these <laughs> people, eating crackers and, and drinking juice at the same time was really just an act of unity. It was really just an act of... Yeah we all believe this and we're all behind this pastor and um, and that kind of thing. It wasn't really about participating in the passion of Christ. It was, <laughs> it was just a symbol. Right. Yeah. And, but, but we talk about this nostalgia for something you've never experienced. I remember doing that. Like I say, it's an Anglican formula, but that's taken of course from uh, Catholic liturgy and really feeling like, Oh yeah, this feels absolutely right. Even though we weren't trained to do that at all yeah. in seminary or anything. Right, but yeah, that nostalgia for something we don't, we've never experienced. I mean, that's that's heaven too, right? Any instance of like overpowering beauty or falling in love uh, or the deep, uh, you know, uh, closeness you feel uh, with a friend once you really bond over something. These are all 
signs of heaven. These are all things that we're longing for that we've never experienced, but deeply, innately, we know this is the fulfillment of all desire. Yeah. I had Father uh, Joshua um, Caswell, fellow Canadian. Oh, from yeah. uh, from from way up north, he's um, he's down at St. Uh, John's uh, St. John Cantus in Chicago now, the Cans regular down there. Uh, but uh, Canadian, thank God for them, Canadian guy, and he was you know, he was raised Pentecostal, and a brilliant story. So listeners who want to hear our amazing conversion story, him and his family, Pentecostal missionaries, went up north, North Canada, Northern Canada, to evangelize the indigenous community up there who were actually already Catholic and they're like reverse evangelizing <laughs> Father Joshua and his family and they all became Catholic, his family on mass, like him and all the, all his siblings and, and parents became Catholic because of the, Amazing. Right, the work of the, you know, the Jesuits who came like, you know, hundreds of years ago who evangelized this group of indigenous people up there who then practiced this vibrant Catholic faith and these Pentecostals come along and actually we're already Christians, we're just, we're, we're Catholic and here's our faith. and. Just a beautiful story, but he, you know, he was Pentecostal and he said that the, the thing, and I love this, the thing we always longed for, like in our charismatic Pentecostal, like services, right? We'd, we'd, just ha we'd have worship in quote services, right? We worship music. We are singing to Jesus. We're singing these praises. I want more of you. I want more of you. And uh, in various forms of song, right? We'd sing these kind of, these kinds of words. And he said when he became Catholic and then became a priest, he finally found the fulfillment of those words he used to right? sing. And he said to me, he's never felt more charismatic in all his Pentecostal right. time than when he celebrates mass, because here's all those things he had longed for and prayed for and desired deeply. I, I can remember, you know, laying prostrate as a Pentecostal Christian, just wanting God to rain down on me, wanting to feel more yep. of him, wanting him to, you know, come into every molecule of my being. Because yep. I was just so open, to, you know, to Christ, and Father Joshua says, "Look, well, here it is. Here's that thing for him as a priest celebrating that, but for all those receiving Christ in the Eucharist, here's a thing that we could never have imagined is actually physically possible." And I thought, "Yeah, yep. that's that's like here's a Pentecostal guy talking to his people. Like that that's it. That's the thing we all wanted." And he goes, "Well, here it is." <laughs> Right. It's that it's that movement I was referring to earlier of we, the the goal of Pentecostal wor uh, worship services, praise and worship, whatever, was to enter into the throne room and could we get there? Yeah. And sometimes you, you even hear worship uh, leaders, even myself, saying things like, "We're almost there." Yeah. Just push a little harder. Yeah. We're almost, <laughs> you know. And now I'm like, "Yep, yeah, you're absolutely what you what uh, yep." Yeah. What, uh, what what Father Jason said and what uh, you just said exactly is right. Is that yeah. God? It reminds reminds me of Romans chapter eight. Um, what we could not do is actually referring to the law. Uh, could not do weakened as it was by the flesh. God did sending His own Son in the likeness of sinful flesh and as an offering for sin, He condemned yeah. sin in the flesh. And it's like, yeah, what we've been trying to do on for good reason, right? The law was not uh, evil. Um, with good motivation, we were trying to do something that God had already done for us. Wait a second, isn't that a Protestant thing? <laughs> Don't they accuse us Catholics of trying to earn something that God's already yeah. done for us? Well, actually, <laughs> it's the other way around, isn't it? And uh, yeah, it's it's astounding how, uh, how 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 my understanding of and your understanding of worship has just been flipped, you know, and, and yeah, it's completely opposite. That's amazing. Uh, hey, yeah, this has been. There, I can't remember. Yeah, this has been an amazing conversation to have with you. I'm very, I'm I've very had so grateful. much fun. It's been, it's been a lot of fun catching up personally, and, and, and you know, in front of all of our listeners here and, and viewers. So that's wonderful. They can just, they can just hang out with us and and enjoy this. Um, why don't you tell people? I don't know if you want to tell people what you've been up to, or what you sure. do. Um, and I can, and I don't know, normally I ask guests if they have, you know, if they have a, a book or something, I can put those links in the show notes. I don't know if you want me to link to this stuff in the show notes or what you, what you want to tell them, but, uh, but I, I give you the floor. What do you want? What do you want to say as sure. I close this thing off? Uh, Joseph. Yeah. <laughs> thank you. Thank you very much. Keith Albert. <laughs> <laughs> I'll take it. Is it Albert Keith or Keith Albert? I can't remember. No, it's Keith Albert. Okay. All right, good. Uh, yeah, no, I'm uh, so I'm 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 serving right now as executive director of Canadian Priests for the Third Millennium, 
you may some people may be familiar with uh, Cardinal Dolan's uh, Cardinal Dolan from New York, his book uh, Priests for the Third Millennium. It's kind of seen as sort of a seminal work for um, understanding the role of priests in the West um, uh, as as it continues to evolve as the Second Vatican Council becomes more and more authentically uh, implemented. And uh, so Canadian priests for the third millennium evolved out of something that actually uh, not a lot of, well, sorry, that a lot of people know about, uh, not a lot of people know the connection. There used to be this um, hockey team called the Flying Fathers. And it was started by Les Costello, who was a Stanley Cup award winning, uh, um, you know, Maple Leaf back in the dark ages when the Maple Leafs last won the Stanley Cup. Oh, no. And, uh, <laughs> He, uh, after winning the cup, uh, uh, he became a priest. So his father, Les Costello, and uh, for you know, it's a, it's actually a great story. But he ended up starting, uh, you know, in order to raise funds for this uh, this kid who was going to go blind, uh, he needed a special surgery. That, so this father, Les Costello, said, "Okay, we're going to get all the priests who play hockey together, and we're going to do a you know a game that that raises funds for this this boy." Well, that exploded over the sixties, seventies, eighties, and nineties. And even the early 2000s and the, the Flying Fathers became a phenomenon across this country. Um, and what was great about it is not only did it help the priests that, who played, you know, develop uh, camaraderie and fraternity and mentorship, but it gave back to communities and, and provided a, an opportunity for priests to, to showcase, yeah, we're normal people. Um, we're normal men and we do things that, you know, that men like to do and, um, and we, and we can do so and give back. We can have fun and be faithful at the same time. Well, wh the, the first benefit that I talked about how, you know, priests uh, were, were finding that they could bond and have fraternity and it actually increased, you know, like their mental health, it, it helped them. Um, when COVID hit and the, uh, the resurgence of the flying fathers kind of got um, stymied in 2020, um, it was some of the players and, and, and other people realized that, oh, we need this. We actually need that for our own selves, even apart from or on top of the charity yeah, work yeah. we're doing. So we, so uh, a group was started called Canadian Priests for the Third Millennium. And um, it's they started to minister to priests and seminarians and discerners, trying to make more and more of, uh, you know, I'm sure each of us has a, an archetype priest in our head, you know, the one that's really conform to the sacred heart of Jesus in his priesthood and is, uh, you know, really faithfully following the church and, and, and is holy and, and, uh, and, and, you know, leads the flock the way that Jesus wants him to, that kind of thing. Um, we're trying to make more and more of them. <laughs> uh, and so in various ways, uh, we help, uh, just, you know, seminarians and priests and discerners um, get the formation they need, sometimes mental health uh, support, um, there's there's a bunch of ways, uh, some of which can be publicly talked about, and others of which can't. Uh, it's certainly hard to raise funds for because you know you, you don't pass the cup around and say, "Hey, would you like to give to Canadian Catholic priests?" No, um, <laughs> that's not a that's a non-starter for 99% of the population. So, uh, like I say, it's hard to raise funds for. But um, we're doing some great work. I've seen I've seen actual priests like actually turn around. You know, priests going through a crisis of faith. Um, actually coming coming through and on the other side and God's been so good and is given me and given us an inordinate amount of favor and blessing that we do not deserve uh, in this work. So I, I do that. Uh, the Flying Fathers are still associated with us. Uh, we're going to be, uh, in fact, we were just in the Sarnia area last November um, doing, a, doing a tour there and that was fun. We're going to be coming back at some point in the near future. Uh, so that's what I do. I, I help priests. Um, in various ways. It's hard to sort of explain sometimes. It would take a lot longer to explain why <laughs> Why do priests need help? They're associated with the richest organization in the world. What's, uh, you know, <laughs> what are you talking about? Uh, it, it gets, it's complicated. Not every priest has access to um, the help that they need. Yeah. Um, if there are any priests or anybody who uh, uh, is interested in knowing more, I think the link you can put in the, uh, in the description is canadianpriest.ca. Um, yeah. Yeah. So, you know, always uh, looking to uh, encounter new people and shape the vision of, um, you know, renewing the church in Canada through uh, helping to renew the Canadian priesthood. Yeah, that, that's awesome. And so uh, important work. For it sure. Is. Yeah. Yeah. And immensely fulfilling. You know, I was, I was really fulfilled in campus ministry. And then when God call, called me in this direction, uh, I didn't want to go. I didn't yeah. want to leave. Yeah. Um, but I've seen now what's going on and, um, 
yeah, just like like I say, you know, you know, what, you ever done something where it's like it shouldn't be this easy, or or rather, the amount of effort I've put in, it this much fruit should not be coming from. Yeah, it. yeah, and it's yeah. clearly God saying, "All right, give me your give me your bread and fish, and I'll feed five thousand people." Yeah, you know, I can think of of other unnamed podcasts who put in that no non effort and receive fruitful, and I'm not bitter. <laughs> I'm not. <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> oh, this cross okay. atmosphere. Listen, <laughs> Joe, it's been an, an absolute thrill. I, I think listeners will be totally enriched by this conversation. I hope they will be. It's an awesome story. And again, I love how our our stories, for better and for worse, intersect at certain places mm -hmm. in kind of uniquely mm -hmm, yeah. interesting ways. So for me personally, maybe it's just an ego trip, I don't know, but it's really fun to have this kind of conversation with you and to hear to hear your story laid out like this and uh, find the fun little places where mine meets yours is really fun. So yeah. Listen, I want to say God bless you, Joe, your family, the work you are you are doing for the church. And sincerely, thank you so much uh, for being with us today, Joe. This has been awesome. Thanks, Keith. I've had a really great time. God bless you.